Um, the way this is going to work, and this is probably to let everybody know, we have um, a series of really great stills. So we're going to try and use that as a sort of through line to talk about Jeremy's life and career, and also, you know, the the way that uh, that impacts and and the other panelists can reflect on their own experiences in some of these areas. Um, it's a bit of there's a lot of moving parts today. So you know, the tech side of things, it's hopefully going to go very smoothly. But because we've got a couple of nice surprises. Just uh, bear with us a little bit on some of those as well. Um, so, um, Jeremy, to start off, uh, so the pictures are going to be up here behind you. I think this might be, I know it's the first one, but this might be my favourite picture of the entire group. Oh, so I don't think I've seen that before. Uh, um, so, one, one thing I can see on the side of it is my dad's Aston Martin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's the Aston Martin behind. So, this is you and your father, Ralph. What age are you? Do you know roughly what sort of age you are? 14. 14. Okay. 13, 14. Um, and for people who don't know, uh, Jeremy's father and uncle were huge, uh, you know, players in the British cinema world, uh, responsible for two of the main sort of, I guess, most popular series of films, the, the Doctor films and then later the Carry On films as well. Um, in Mark's documentary, Jeremy, you talk about um, being infected by the virus of cinema, which even in a pandemic, I still, you know, sounds, sounds good to me. Um, do you had, by this, by the time of this sort of photograph, would you say you were already fully infected and already thinking about where you could sort of find your own place? With yes, it? I'd already had a camera. I was spoiled. I had a camera, you know, and I shot. I even shot, I shot with my sister and Gareth Forward, a film in Dirk Bogart's house when I was about, 12, 10, because it involved going to the Vishmanga and getting all these fish, I remember it strongly, I still remember it. And, uh, you yeah, know, I was thinking about it then, but I didn't really uh, understand what film, I didn't understand really uh, about it at all, but I had a camera and they processed this reversal film for me and we put it together. And given the nature of the type of films your father, and thank you, Dan, <coughs> Was it a conscious decision for you to go in a very different direction? Was there ever a thought that you'd maybe carry on making the sort of things that they had been very successful and popular with? Well, you can't intellectualize things like that when you're a kid, you know. You don't know anything, really. And, uh, well, you know something and you're learning things. But I had no idea what I was going to do, except that I found this world very enticing, the smell, even the smell of a studio. And at that time, I was f completely free to sort of, in the holidays, cycle to the studio, go around every film set in the back lot. And uh, um, I, I knew that I wanted to go into this business. What wasn't obvious that I was a very, very bad recalcitrant student, <laughs> and um, very in a in a in a very sort of privileged school. But I wanted to get out of there fast, and I didn't make it to 17 in in schooling. And uh, my father said to me, listen, you go to work. You gotta go to work. And I got a job which was quite a difficult job, which was including night work in the laboratory in Denham. And uh, with terrible smelly chemicals and your eyes burned. But I was there, you know, and I learned to do that before I then moved on to get, because I had to get a union card with the clothes shop. And that was decided the way. And then I got uh, my, uh, my trajectory got, got to change by some people. Yeah. Um, I just want to keep on this idea of infection because I'm, I'm fascinated by, you know, people, you know, cinema just gets into us, people who love it, and it's something then that that's a lifelong condition. So I wanted to talk uh, to the other people on the panel. Um, when we discuss cinema, it's so often through stars or the director, the auteur thing. And so the producer's name is not. There have been some very famous producers over the years whose names do have a sort of you know, recognition. But I just wouldn't, wanted to hear from each of you guys. When did you first become aware of Jeremy's work yourselves? <laughs> Was there a particular film or body of films? Because you know, it may have been advertised by who was in it or the director of it. But if you look at his body of work, there's so many things that seem to coalesce and, and come together. So maybe, Mark, because you've spent a lot of time <laughs> with him recently, was there a particular film or series of films that you, know, you got infected with the Jeremy Thomas cinematic? Yeah, films? yeah. When I was 18, I saw Bad Timing. And it's pretty young, uh, pretty young to see Bad Timing because it's such a grown-up film. And I just thought, wow. 
And then I started to recognize this, this title that would appear in the films, P Jeremy Thomas Presents. And you would get a tingle when you saw that, because you know you're in for a, a rough ride. You know, it was not going to be safe. It was going to be dangerous. It was going to be uh, 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 on the dark side, you know. And of course, when you're that age, 18, 19, you're really excited by that. And then Eureka, wow. OK, so some of the, some of the early, early stuff. Um, Ben, did you come in a bit later? Or did you rem remember sort of recognizing this, this person who was behind films that you were hopefully getting into? Yeah, I think it was a documentary about the making of Naked Lunch. That's where I, I first went, oh, look. That's, it seemed you were, you were quite featured in it, I remember. And I was going, oh. That. And then I remember seeing you in a restaurant somewhere. And, Bloody hell, it's Jeremy Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> It was that, yeah, I just, it just stuck in my mind afterwards. And then, and then yeah, like Mark was saying, then it's the, the kind of, you start to see it, the name popping up. But then the, the real thing that got me in the end was, more obviously, but when I went to the office at Hamway Street for the first time, and you go up the stairs to Hamway Street, and all the posters are, for all the productions are on, were on the stairs, and it was like a kind of, um, you know, this intense um, indoctrination of like this, you know, <laughs> There's an incredible amount of work here. This is, in, in, and and all, often these movies are all insane as well. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what higher recommendation do you need, um, Rebecca? As a producer, I'm I would, I'm interested in. Did you have any sort of like role models or people that you looked to, to when you wanted to get into this? And was Jeremy among them? And if so, what what caught your eye of his work? Well, basically, I I I think I I mean I started off at the Edinburgh Film Festival. And I was just chucked, chucked at me, you know, with Linda Miles. And, and I had films, amazing films, chucked at me, uh, you know, from, from, from then on. And, uh, you know, this, this same name kept on popping up as the producer. And I, I didn't even, I didn't know what a producer was, but I think um, Jeremy was probably the first real producer name I actually saw and registered because he kept on being on all these extraordinary films. So it was simply that. And um, yeah, I mean, so for me, he was like, I, I mean, I, I never thought I could do the same, I never did the same job as him, but, but a job that was this, had the same title as him. It was just like way off in the stars, given how extraordinary these films were. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on, even though I love this shot. <laughs> We're going to go to another, another one, which is uh, a really lovely picture, which is, <laughs> I guess, early days. Um, so, Jeremy, you, you started, well, not started, but one of your early roles was editing. Um, and that was for Ken Loach. At the, at well, the I went to, to work for Ken as a lad. I'd worked on, I, I worked, I then graduated to Pirate, to the numbering room, and then I got a, a job for an editor called John Victor Smith who sadly died a couple of years ago. He was Dick Lester's editor, but he, I got a call from him. Do you want to come and work with me on Harder They Come in London? <laughs> it was an incredible break, you know, because I, I, it, it was, you know, it was, I was exposed to Chris Blackwell and the world of Ireland Records as an 18-year-old, you know, 18, 19-year-old. 19, 18, then I got a, a, a job um, from another editor called Roy Watts, who had a white Rolls Royce, if you can believe it, that he, would, and he lived in Isha, but he was Ken's editor for many movies. And uh, I started on a Jim Allen play called uh, The Rank and File, and then The Big Flame. And then I was the first assistant editor on uh, Family Life, which had a, a sort of hiatus because of tragedy in the middle of it. And then I went to an edited film for him at the BBC, and that was, um, it, it, he, he was one of the, uh, it was of course my dad, but the next person who really got me infected by various things was Ken, because I came from a, a background like that. And I then understood a lot through Ken and the people around Ken at that time, um, Neville Smith, Jim Allen, Tony Garnett, Irving Teitelbaum, these names probably mean little, but they were very, very important figures to me. and. Um, yeah, I became pretty much ostracized from my family group because I became sort of quite too too much enthusiasm for that. 
<laughs> okay. for, for politics. The, the politics side. are different than uh, growing up in Jared's Cross and Bakersfield. Did they feel rejected by you? No, but my father was wise. He never was too confrontational, but you know, um, he was, he just, uh, you go off and do it yourself, you know, and uh, privilege is over. Privilege is over. Maybe that then was I, a, that, then I found a, a, a Then I found a middle way of enjoying the politics and the, the way and enjoying my life, that what life threw at me, you know. Right. And did, at this stage when you're editing, did you ever consider keeping that as your main role, or were you already getting either restless or curious? No, I, wanted to to I wanted to do it like everybody in the world. Um, I wanted to direct. <laughs> <laughs> and I could tell a few jokes about that, but I won't, because everybody <laughs> knows the jokes. But, um, you know, that's what I wanted to do, like my dad, train driver, a different type. And then um, I m edited a film documentary, very good documentary called Brother Kitty's Paradigm for an Australian called Philippe Mora, who's a painter and a, a directed a film, a little film and he said, let's go to Australia, I can get some cash and I got a letter from my father to somebody called Sir Norman Ridge, who ran the Greater Union Organisation and British Empire Films, which were ran, who distributed all films in Australia look after my son and my father delivered, I don't know how many billions of dollars of hits for him. Anyway, I arrived in Australia with my friend who got money through months from people in Melbourne and there was a new system like financing films. I went to see this old man and he said, um, your father made a lot of money to you, for me, what do you want? I said, I want to get some money. He said, I'd go and see my guy who runs my film company. The next day, I went to see the guy who ran the film company and he said, what do you, you the, the old man told me to give you $200,000. What? Yeah. And it was like, uh, I thought about it for, for the time of his natural life or something like that for a book of, okay, I'm gonna send you to the governor of New South Wales, he'll give you a thousand acres, you know. Some folk. Anyway, it was like that coming. It was an amazing story. I, I, it was, it's really stuck with me, that letter sealed with a gong man, rank gong man behind it, going by hand, sent to this guy's office. And I came $200,000, ching. So that was, um, that was a very good beginning, but then Dennis Hopper came into the picture, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I learned about making movies from t sort of diving off a diving board, with 120 speaking parts in period, starring Dennis Hopper. That was quite a, an incredible. Well, it's much documented. This this film is much yeah. documented in documentaries and books, but it was um, it was some ride and. Uh, Along for the along for the ride, basically. You sometimes get on a film that you are along for the ride, you know, and you can't, you, you know, it's like completely hard to control the beast. I mean, I know those those stories are well documented, but I think, you know, do you have? Could you share just one particularly memorable uh, Hopper encounter or Hopper thing that you had to deal with as, uh, you know, in well, your kind of very new role? Well, I had. visited him. This is a little longer story, but it's so rich. Um, okay. Dennis Hopper's agent, the only agent he could find in Hollywood at that time, was called Robert Raison, who was famous for being Cole Porter's lover, and for me, for wearing a velvet bathing costume with that, whilst he did with a mirrored board, sun bathing <laughs> yes, inside, yeah. kidney-shaped pool in Beverly Hills. So I went to see him, we want Dennis Hopper in this film, he said, I love it, Dennis gets bargained in this film. I'm going to send you to Taos, Taos, New Mexico. So Philip Moore and I went to Taos, New Mexico, Dennis Hopper, sort of greeted us in this little plane firing a gun into the air. And uh, after various hot springs and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and um, what happened, happened in Taos, New Mexico, that, that era, uh, we might be up to Australia looking forward to Dennis's arrival. Anyway, Dennis arrived and he was there. He came out of the customs and he had nothing with him. I said, where's your suitcase? I don't have any, man. Where are your clothes? I, you supply them, man. I said, well, 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 he had nothing. He just had boots, cowboy suit, and a passport. And you can imagine that evening sort of pouring him out of his car, just fuck off to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and we got him. And that night, he was in jail. <laughs> okay, so that's what I had to deal with at the beginning of my career. And I, it's, got, it's got a bit easier since then. <laughs>
And you loved actors ever since. I love actors. <laughs> That's, um, I'm an unusual producer because I like difficult actors. And I enjoy them <laughs> as a game, as a sport. It's a, sport. <laughs> it's a sporting endeavor. I'm enjoying <laughs> actors because they're the best, you know. And you can't really make a film without a good group of actors, you know, like your crew, but they're part of the group. And if you can find that, then you're very lucky, you know. Rebecca, I couldn't tell if you were like laughing in like solidarity or in like shaking your head as like, I can't believe you're saying that. Did you, does that is that similar for you? Or? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's absolutely appropriate somehow. I think it's so wonderful when an actor turns up and they are what they say on the tin. <laughs> you know, to receive Dennis Hopper with guns blazing, that's just entirely right. I, I mean, I would dis be disappointed with any less. Um, and it's interesting because working with great actors, actually, in a way like Dennis, they need nothing. They don't want all the... They really don't want all the... They just want to turn up and be with you and they want to be with the director and they want to be with a, a producer they respect. You know, a great actor is all about the team and, and understanding how... The, you know, the challenge for them is to be part of this idea and to get themselves onto the screen as best they can for the director and the producer. And, and, and so when you have a really great actor... That's what they do. And I remember w I worked with um, James McAvoy and Claire Foy last year, and neither of them... We were, we were doing a, a real pandemic film, shooting it in a week, in the pouring rain, the sideways rain of the Scottish Highlands. And we said, look, we, we, we're shooting it in, in sequence and we're shooting it, like, for real, t in real time, more or less. So we, we're not going to give you caravans or anything like that we want you just to suffer as much as the rest of the crew and they were absolutely up for it they were up for it it was like you know we if we buy into the thing we'll do we don't need the trappings and I think you know I think when trappings get in the way you've sort of lost your actor yeah when I mean, they like their trappings <laughs> I mean, he turned up one in clothes yeah, we, 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 we uh, Ben and I had a, a lot of um talent on um, on high rise and it was um, a genuine group having a good time being serious about the work but it it, 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 it was good I mean that there was a sort of closeness to the, the crew the, the, you know the, the acting it was, it was wonderful wasn't it? Yeah, I think it's a thing about speed as well isn't it it's not just it's it you want them not to get back to their caravans mm -hmm. and 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 I think it's that thing of when they don't if they if if you can make the schedule work for you, that it's fast enough that they don't have time to think, then it then it really helps. Because if you if you give them too much time, the measuring tape will come out, as it did on on the Mr. Bean film that I did, where Bert Reynolds <laughs> had a, had his agent have a measuring tape to see that his trailer was longer than Rowan Atkinson's. <laughs> and I've been lucky. <laughs> <laughs> no measuring trailers on, no, on no. crash and stuff. I removed the trailers. <laughs> yeah. I've removed Problem the solved. trailers on, um, because of, uh, for various reasons, I've removed film stars trailers. I put a tent there with a, a, a Russell and Hobbs kettle and a fridge. <laughs> because they wanted and to they be with they each went, other. And it was in the desert and they weren't happy. But he's happy now. He laughs about it now. <laughs> <laughs> but the, sometimes needs must, you know. Sure. Um, I'm going to bring up um, three slides sort of in succession because what I'd like to kind of um, talk about, about now are the re relationships between producer and director. You've worked with so many, you know, amazing directors. And I think that whole dynamic uh, is something I'd be really interested in, in uh, hearing from you and also from the others. So the first shot we have is Nick, you and Nicholas Rogue, and you made several films with him in the, I guess, the late 70s, early 80s. Um, I'll just I'll show them all first, and then we can maybe talk a little bit about each of these uh, people. Then we've got Nagisa Oshima, with whom you made Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence in 1983, I believe. And Gahato. And Gahato. And Gahato, yeah, of course. And of course, <laughs> Bernardo Bertolucci. I'm assuming very much on the set of The Last Emperor. In the back of the Beijing studio, yeah. Yeah, sometime in the mid-1980s. So I guess 
recognise. Just as a sort of framing idea of that, because these are all incredibly talented, I presume very different personalities, but yet you found a way to sort of synergise your work with them. When you uh, sort of are approaching a director for a particular project, is it for you a sort of case-by-case -case thing of assessing how they work, what they need, or do you find a sort of a, a, a kind of kindred spirit in each, each of these people so that you know then that this is going to make sense for the journey that you have to sort of embark on with them? Well, it's very important to like and trust the filmmaker you're working with. You know, I was in a, an admiration of these filmmakers before I had the chance to work with them, and I felt privileged that I had an opportunity to work with Nick Rogue. I was, you know, I was hanging around the set of performance when I was a boy, and um, that was the hippest place in the world at that moment. As you do. <laughs> she just dropped that one so casually. <laughs> <laughs> because I lived, no, I was, I, I was not on the set. I was, I was a boy who was living in West London. And the hippest place at that moment, did you know, Mick Jagger's in there, and Nick Rogue, and Donald Camel. Wow. And we went outside and watched the goings on in Powers Terrace, and that was, that was, that was really, and I do think that at that very moment on the planet, there couldn't have anywhere that was the, the center of it. You know, so I wanted to work with Nico, and I tried to get him to direct the shout, if you can imagine, I hope that. And, um, and he was very nice with me. And then after the shout got to the Grand Prix can, I went back to him and said, I really want to work with you. I, I, you're my master, you know. And um, he said, okay, if you can get this rights to this book, it was called Illusions at the time. If you can get right to Illusions, I'll do it. And shook my hand. And he was about to start with Flash Gordon, which in fact he didn't start. Anyway, I went to Rome, neophyte filmmaker, and uh, had to see Carlo Ponti in the rights. And I sat in this large house with Carlo Ponti. And uh, who was it? You know, it was Carlo Ponti, for Christ's sake. Oh, wow. And he was, he was quite nice with me. <laughs> and he said, I want $25,000. Can you make the decision now? All's go away. I didn't have twenty five thousand dollars. I didn't know where I got. I shook it hands and yeah, said, "Yes, I'll get it to you next week." <laughs> and somehow, I got them to London. And somehow, I got the money together from various people, and I sent the twenty five thousand dollars. And I went back to Nico. I'll do it. I'll do it. Amazing. Now, and he'd just been fired from Lash Gordon, so it was perfect. <laughs> it was a Good perfect, timing. It was a very perfect set of. I mean, it was called Illusions, and then one day we had a. All of us got a lawsuit from Richard Bach, who wrote this book, Illusion, for like $50 billion of damages. And so we had, obviously we had to change the name from Illusions to Bad Timing, because it was using, you know, it was a, it was a joke title. We made the title as a sort of, it was enjoyable for ourselves. But it turned into a great, a great yeah, title for the movie. Amazing. And when you're working with someone uh, from, you know, a, a very different culture, is there some? Is there a special way for you to sort of make yourself and them comfortable? Well, with I like. I don't speak do. Japanese. It's, well, that's kind I mean, of what I'm and, um, alluding to. Or Chinese, or Bhutanese, or all these places, or, Mal or Malian. But I can communicate with people in any language, and I pick up some language enough, and then uh, it's a it's an international language, cinema, and uh, you all sort of seem to know what you're talking about, and it's rather my joy to be sort of parachuted into the middle of Mali to make a film with Sulema Sisse. How could you be greater than that? Wow, am I lucky? Only, only person with him and, you know, and a group of people. And that was something, you know, one of the best experiences of my life. You know, it was, a, you know, something, how privileged am I to have something like that and to understand that. And the same with the Rinpoche in Bhutan I work with many times. You know, it's some, something, another part of my enjoyment of the job that I do. And I was, I was sort of privileged enough to get those elements and areas to stimulate my work and my enjoyment of the world, you know, which is um, in cinema world, it's quite small, you know, because we can watch the whole world. And I learned about the world from in this very, very place that we are sitting in now. I learned about the world, the world of cinema and um, the outside world of um, dreary old Britain. Just to flip that then, so Ben and Mark, as directors, when you are sort of brought together with a producer for a new project, what are you 
hoping to hear or wanting to hear because with someone like, I mean, we can talk about later when you worked with specifically with Jeremy, but when you have a producer, how are you wanting that to sort of go? Are you wanting them to very much go along with your vision or are you hoping it's going to be a sort of hybrid that you, the two of you can find something new to develop? Uh, I feel that um, the the producer needs to articulate and expand the space in which the film will exist. The, uh, the, the producer needs to sort of create the citadel, the safe place in which the film happens, so they build, a, build the walls and stand with the gun and fire people off if they try to attack. And you know, So that the producer needs to, uh, to be able to describe the film better than, uh, better than the director and say, this is the film, this is what it will be in the world, and this is why you want it. It's about of articulation. Obviously, there's other stuff about contracts and legal, you know, but the main thing, I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for me. A mere bagatelle. <laughs> well, quite a big bagatelle, isn't it? But I, I, I think that the, it depends how you define the director, and I think the idea of, like, the kind of auteur director and the, um, is, a, is not a very precise kind of description, and I think that the, the, the director and the producer together are um, collaborating on the thing and the, and the authorship is across those two positions as much also as it is with the writer and the editor and the actors, you know. And so it's, it's a kind of almost a journalistic kind of thing to go, oh, it's, it's down to the director. It's much more porous than that and it, and it changes from project to project. So, I mean, I don't know, to answer your question, m most of the films I've made have been um, through a company that I'm involved in you know so and it's all we're all partnered together on it so it kind of um so that experience is that and then when i've done it outside of that then 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 yes it's this kind of meeting in a kind of coming together and trying trying to work out what uh, that you're all you know a lot of energy is put on to making sure you're all on the same page so there's not a, not a horror show in the edit suite afterwards because sure. that's the, the main thing you want to avoid that everyone's moving together you know yeah and Rebecca, just briefly, just to finish off on that, Rebecca, because you've done so many films with the same director, Ken Loach, when you go outside that, are you, do you have to sort of, you know, almost like step back and approach it again? Or, you know, are you in a sort of rhythm because you've done so many films with the same person? The director, the, my, my relationship with the director is, is paramount. It's absolutely paramount because, as Mark was saying, I mean, I'm... I'm 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 sort of following the the film on a sort of macro scale. I'm I'm looking after the film from inception to archive, and so I'm 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 also, as it were, the first audience for the film at every stage, and I'm the first person to relate the film to an audience probably, because I'm finding the tools to sell it to the outside world, sure. whereas the director is on a on a sort of a micro scale, uh, looking after the detail of the actual project, project, and so we're completely bound together. And if we, you know, we're we're, we're both selling the same thing. We're both telling the same story. And so if we're not on the same trajectory, we're fucked, you know. And the writer is key to that as well. So with me and Ken and Paul, Paul is absolutely crucial to that because he writes. You know, Ken doesn't write, but and so we are completely interwoven in terms of what we do. So Paul's writing has bits of Ken in it. Ken's directing has bits of producing in it. Right. I contribute to both, but but we it's quite clear. Paul mainly writes, Ken mainly directs, and I mainly produce. So we take those credits, and it's but it, it's like that tripod of existence is 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 the thing that's that is the reason we've gone on for so long because we're great friends we just love being together and I mean I would never want to work with a director I couldn't get pissed with or couldn't find a way of of just loving them in some way you have to love your director I think because you know it, it you you've got to spend a lot of time with them mm -hmm. And you've also got to be able to say no to them. And you've also, so you've actually got to have, like, it, it, like a sort of work marriage with them. Yeah. Well, um, sorry, you can tell that story now. <laughs> What's I mean, it? Come on, Ben. It reminded me of a story just this afternoon, and I, I nearly collapsed with tears because I remember it. Yeah. So well, funny. On, um, on, on High Rise, we, um, they all stayed at some really swanky hotel. 
and I stayed in a, in like basically the house from the young ones <laughs> down down in Bangor with the rest of the crew, which was cool. I asked I asked for it until I saw what the hotel was like that they were all staying at, which was amazing, some kind of castle thing, and uh, and so we did it edit there in the evening, so shoot during the day, come back and have a few beers and edit. And, um, and then Jeremy would come down, wouldn't you, and kind of see what we were up to and stuff. And, uh, and then we one day got the wrong house and just burst into the house next to us, right through the front door, right all the way to the kitchen. The people are watching TV in the back and he's smoking this massive joint. He's like, <laughs> like that. And like, fuck. And that was <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that was that was. was uh, they came around the street. They were completely. They were like old accidents. These people. I think I got the wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, that's the glamour of um, of high rise. Glamour, <laughs> glamour of Belfast. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to bring up the first, um, hopefully, nice surprise for you. So this is a, a pre-recorded. It's talking of director-producer relationships. We've got a message from a director you've worked with, and. Uh, just going to play it. I'm just a bit awkward for you, I know. So maybe if you want to turn around, please do. But this is uh, this came in just earlier today. Hey, I'm Richard Shepard. I'm the writer director of Dom Hemingway, that starred Jude Law and Richard E. Grant, that um, Jeremy produced. I remember getting the script to Jeremy. I didn't know him, but I was a huge fan of his. Obviously, I mean, when I was growing up, the hit. Oh my God, that movie just blew my mind, and you know. All through the years, whether it was the Bertolucci movies, whether it was Bad Timing, whether it was Sexy Beast, I mean, Jeremy just just had his finger on something unique as a filmmaker, and sending to him was really a, a wild shot in the dark. I was an American director. I wasn't well known. I had written this small little movie, and I get a phone call from Jeremy like a week after sending the script, and... He's calling from some beach somewhere. He's already a bit of a mumbler, and with the British accent mumbling, probably stoned transatlantic cell phone connection, I, I heard about one av av out of every three words that Jeremy said, but I think he liked it. And the next thing I know, I'm on a plane to, to London and immersed immediately in Jeremy's film world. Um, anyone who knows him knows that no one loves movies more than he does. I'm a film geek, but Jeremy is something else altogether. And walking into his old offices in Soho and seeing these posters, these posters I'd never seen because they were European posters or from some specific weird country to all his movies, I would just spend hours walking up and down the stairs, opening doors and finding weird boxes with film posters and film canisters. He just loved movies and he loved the way movies are made. Um, he took a special delight in finding the right restaurant for us to go to at the end of the day and knowing the name of the owner and what to order and picking up the check, thank you, Jeremy, and making the experience of making the movie as pleasurable as it possibly could be. I mean, it's hard work as we all know but to have this cheerleader, this man who absolutely backs you creatively, is something altogether different. And it was one of those experiences I will never forget. Jeremy's also very smart and savvy about the film business, but also about filmmaking. And he's the only producer I've ever worked with who I listened to every single note he gave me. He didn't give a lot of notes, but when Jeremy gave me a note, I listened to it. Um, Jeremy, I'm, I love you. I loved working with you. I love the movie we made together. I'm so proud that you're getting honored tonight. I'm sure you're getting honored all over the place. You should be 24 hours a day for anyone who loves movies. Um, enjoy the night. I wanted to talk a little bit about your, well, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your relationship with Bernardo Bertolucci because in terms of, I guess, the industry, you kind of hit the peak by winning, you know, the best picture of the year Oscar for The Last Emperor. And it's one of those movies that if people just see it now, it's like, oh, it's a prestige, obvious Oscar movie, whereas it was a hugely difficult independent production that you spent many years putting together. I just wondered how, you know, obviously... Well, you don't think story. about Oscars when you make a film. I mean, as Mark Pepler 
um, there we, that, yeah, well, that, well, yeah, I mean, this is from Shattering Sky. Yeah, Shattering Sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's Hercules Melville, my long time dear departed colleague. Herky. Yeah, we'll talk and, about it. Uh, and there we are, in somewhere like, uh, it's in the Valley de Dra, down uh, near Erfrud, a fantastic place to be working. But it was obviously a very sort of fruitful collaboration. No, it was the best. Together. It was the best friendship. It was a sort of, of great relationship, um, best relationship, and it lasted all until you know Bernardo died, and then um, from when I met him, and I got a call one day, having done Merry Christmas. He sort of, I was friendly with Mark, who was up there, and Claire Peplow, recently departed. I'm sad to say. And uh, they said to Bernardo, who I'd met a few times socially at film festivals or something, why did you see Jeremy about this? So I got a call from him, and I suggested to Chinese restaurant to go into Li Ho Fu to go and have some dumplings. And he said, strange, you should choose that because here's these two volumes of a book from Member to Citizen. And uh, you know, I didn't think that I would be an asked to make a film by Bernardo. Although he had had a bit of a down period with his work in Hollywood, you know, after the films, in, in, you know, La Luna and Tragedy of a Ridiculous Man, I, it was ripe for me. And um, I went on that journey and adventure. I, I had the sort of bravery with him, and he was braver than me, but, you know, we went to do that into China, into the unknown. But that is a great thing about filmmaking, if you can sort of confident, give the confidence to people that give you money to go into an adventure like that. You know, how lucky are you? you know. I think the, f the first time that I personally ever saw you and actually understood about the producer was I think I was a kid and I was watching the Oscars ceremony. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously they saved Beck's picture to last and I'd seen Bernardo Bertolucci win director and then you got up. I was like, ah, oh, okay, someone else is <laughs> intimately involved in putting this together. And it was... Um, your speech. Yeah, it was, a, it was an extraordinary moment. You know, and, and, um, yeah, it's just, you, I mean, it's sort of, I never really regarded, I mean, the Oscars, when you're a filmmaker, they're so remote from the idea that you're going to have an Oscar. Um, and it's a sort of, it's something that you say, you've got to be in it to win it, basically. And it becomes very interesting. When you're nominated, it becomes something completely different and something that you don't want to include yourself in. You get drawn along into that maelstrom. Um, so this, as we said, this still is from The Sheltering Sky, which is the film you made with Bernardo after The Last Emperor. Um, we've got a very special guest who's uh, zooming in live right now. So I'm just going to, this is the tech bit that might be a little bit tricky, so please bear with us, but it will be worth it. So I'm just going to hit click on this. And I very much hope Whoa. you're going to see Deborah Winger. Deborah Winger. I can't see any of you, so it's very disconcerting. Uh, <laughs> can she see us? Else? No. no. Can you see? Oh, Deb. Yeah. Deborah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, I, I was emulating your hair. Trying to <laughs> Rachel, your hair. <laughs> Deborah, it's, it's fantastic that you could join us. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, you're in Mark's documentary talking very you know, beautifully about Jeremy. For people who haven't seen it, could you just give the, the people here a little bit of a sense about your experience working with Jeremy and, and, and how maybe that's been different in a, in a good way compared to maybe other producers you've worked with across your career? <laughs> well, the bar was low, first of all. <laughs> I can say that in my entire life, Jeremy Thomas is the best producer that I've ever worked with. So there's nothing, there's nothing I'm not, it's not even a superlative, it's just a fact. And I can't really explain in your time frame why, but it's for all the things that I'm sure you're discussing and more. Um, it's so interpersonal. Um, I also have a very personal reason for, you know, immediately taking a liking to him because at the moment that I met him in my life, I had developed quite a reputation of being a bad girl and then I came over there and started, or actually our first film was here, but I've met Jeremy Thompson. I said, 
they don't even know what bad is. <laughs> you can get all that work done. You can be totally ingratiating, totally effective, and be a bad boy. So that was a great lesson for me. <laughs> And you made you've made two films together, is that right? Because you yeah, did Everybody up, Wins. Yeah. I, I think of the first one as just the one that facilitated us meeting, yeah. so that okay. we could make the second. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Um, Deb, I don't know if you saw it, but we had the still that we had up um, uh, from the Sheltering Sky had um, Hercules Belleville in it as well. And now I understand, obviously, he worked with Jeremy for a long time, but he was also a good friend of yours. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about. Uh, Hercules and your relationship with him mm. and his importance to the whole project. It's just the, it's really really hard to express and I know anyone that knew them together it's hard to express how perfect of a team they were and um, besides her being one of the great characters of all time uh, you know it's just it's unbelievable that he's gone because, uh, you know, he should have been here forever if anyone should have been. But but the two of them together was finer than any film you could watch. So, you know, when you have that in front of you, you're just reaching for that amount of authenticity, individuality, and effectiveness. I know I sound like a fucking ad oh i probably should <laughs> you know, it's okay it's okay you can speak freely here right, you're amongst friends <laughs> it's totally true and i think everybody knows i'm not want to just you know speak in superlatives so you're very authentic also well, actually, Jeremy, I was going to say, since Deborah's here, I mean, she's talked about uh, meeting you and how you found her. How was, how was your experience of working with her on Sheltering Sky? Well, it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was a relationship. <laughs> because we'd been through a very difficult film with Arthur Miller, Carol Rice, and Nick Nolte. Um, it was a strange experience. In fact, the film doesn't look so bad now, but it was very, very painful to make. Emotionally painful for all of us. It was such a difficult experience. Didn't, I mean, it sunk in afterwards how difficult it was. And um, then when, you know, Bernardo said, I want Deborah, yeah, yes, it could be fantastic. And uh, it was a wonderful, we went on a journey, it was a true journey into the unknown, we did. And Deborah really, I mean, it, was, it must have been one of the greatest experiences and deep best experiences of your life when you went into the desert alone and really to get into the character was, was an amazing thing to be able to do. So I don't think you could do that anymore. Well, we know we couldn't do any of that anymore. Uh, you can't do that. And we couldn't go to those places anymore anyway. The, you can't even get to those yeah. places. Politically, you can't get in, enter these places. We won't. So it was a unique experience. And uh, Paul Bowles' word, and even you had a scene with Paul Bowles. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. Did you, how was that for you to work with the man who actually wrote the original... Uh, Book. Well, he only had two lines. <laughs> okay. No, I, haven't it, I haven't words. seen it for a while. I've got yeah, words. Are, are you lost? <laughs> a, he didn't have a lot of dialogue. And, yeah, Deborah says yes. But you remember the big smile, Deborah, that you have when you say that? Yeah, it's a fantastic ending. Yes, well, I mean, I was there in the desert with a three year old as well. And so that was, uh, that three year old is now 34. But um, wow, no. That was a pretty amazing experience yeah, yeah. to not feel uh, that I was ever really in danger. And that's, you know, such a tribute to the producer of a film like that, where you have to live as if you're in danger and you have to access. And to tell you the truth, we were, in a, we were in a lot of danger. <laughs> <laughs> you said you, you were in a lot of danger. We were protected by Mano Dayak, who, who soon afterwards got blown up in a bomb that we might have been in. But um, we were in Agadez, in Niger, and you know, there were you know, a lot of problems that we knew about, but we didn't tell the others. <laughs> you, couldn't well. shoot, you couldn't no, shoot it. You couldn't shoot it anywhere. There was a flash flood one morning, and we couldn't get to the location. And I remember that you were on the other yeah, side. We, we, we would have to sleep overnight. And Bernardo and I had to sleep in a hut because the, with the fire and with Tuareg, because the, we couldn't get our our Mercedes 
over the <laughs> over the over the over the bridge. Fantastic. So rather than stagger through this flooded river, we stayed the night in this terrible place. Yeah. A bit like Sheltering Sky. You know, it's going too far. I mean, Sheltering Sky is about going too far. Going too far, yeah. You know, yeah. And no off button. And uh, there was a period in my filmmaking career when I had no off button and I uh, went too far, you know, virtually, nearly. And a lot of insurrection we had around us. It was great. <laughs> Um, De Deborah, finally, I mean, it sounds like for you that that film, the experience of Sheltering Sky, it's not just the film itself, but the experience of making it has, you know, is one of the most impactful jobs that you've had. Would you, would you say that? Oh, it was totally transformational for my life in a good way. And I think that forever Jeremy is fused with that for me. And uh, I saw you right before the scourge for your birthday. Claire and I surprised Jeremy and came up to wish him a happy birthday, and so I hope that we'll be together well, again. Well, I'll see, see, you, uh, see you very, very soon. And of course, we had the privilege of working with the maestro, which was really a sort of poetic experience and um, very, very engaging and lucky thing to have had for so, me for 25 years and Deborah for a bit, you know. Well, Deborah, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, such, it's a real treat for everybody here, as well as uh, Jeremy and the people on the panel. So thank you so much. Will you give a round of applause? Oh. Oh, You're looking good. You're looking good. I don't, I don't want to like press off to kind of move, I have to kind of move you can, on. You it's can really, hang around if you want. It's really <laughs> gutting to like, you know, turn Deborah Winger off on a <laughs> Zoom chat. Thank you so that was much. That's nice. That was very nice. Um, right. We're gonna, we've actually touched on this already, but I think we can go a little bit more into more detail with specifics. I'm a very, you know, you, D Jeremy, you said earlier that you're a producer who loves actors. And I think that comes across just from the performances in the movies and, and the way that directors work with them as well. So I've got a couple of stills here. This is obviously Mr. Bowie uh, on location. And Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston. No, no, no. Uh, from Jim Jarmusch's film Only Love Is Left Alive. Um, could you, exp I mean, you, you have touched on it already, but what is it about people like Bowie or Tilda Swinton that, that you see that, make, you know, you want them to be in it and then the relationship that you obviously have seems to really work because there's a connection there? I don't know, I'm lucky. You know, I was lucky. I can, yeah, I can, I, I can, um, I suppose because I've been trying to intellectualize it a bit recently, because I'm doing something with somebody who's a huge superstar, maybe the biggest superstar around, and people around him, we don't understand how you can talk to this person like that. I said, because he's not a superstar to me. You, you know, I, grew, I mean, I've, my whole life I've been surrounded by people like that, and they're fragile and human like you are. And it's just, you know, it's something that I was able to understand as very young because of my dad and where I grew up with all these people around me. And I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm quite a sh shy person in some respects, but with talent, I'm not shy, you know, because they are an essential makeup for me to enjoy what I'm doing. I have to be, if I, if I was, I mean, many producers are frightened to go to the set, seriously because they know they are, they're absolutely despised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I despised a producer called Henry T. Weinstein, who was the producer of a film I was working as an editor, and he used to wear a black velvet suit. And when he came out, we used to go, well, look at the human ashtray. He had a cigar. He was a human ashtray. He was covered in ash, and he was vulgar and everything else. God rest him. But, um, that was the image of a producer. And those are images that are sort of given to us pretty much by the movies as a tradition of the producer is a sort of pretty brutal money, <laughs> money, money dealing person with no morals. But you know, there are all sorts, and there are lots like that. I mean, they're in jail, some of them, but I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they're that, that, that is the, um, you know, that's not true. I mean, it's, it's to look at Rebecca 
and, um, and, and look at the people. I'm not in jail. <laughs> and, look at Rebecca, and look at the people she you know, choose to work with her. And I suppose the same with me. So, you know, we've, we've sort of, we can show our cards. Sure. You know? And when we go, when I go to meet filmmakers, or not filmmakers, um, bosses, as little as possible, but when I do and see bosses, I want to say, show me your cards, man. You know, when they're telling me what to do. I want to say, you know, you put your cards on the table. I'll give you mine. You know, I've got a, I've got a, you know, I've got a roll flush here. And you show me your cards. You can show me a couple of low numbers. You know, <laughs> so in the card game, and you just have to swallow it up, you know, and you just have to have it to be reinvented for you. Continue to reinvent it, what films are to you by the people who are giving you the resources to do them, pretty much. I don't know if that other people, your experience, but I mean, that's basically because I've been so long at it and it's the sort of same person who's been in front of me uh, challenging what I wanted to do. I think not being phased by stardom is absolutely essential. I mean, you, you know, I absolutely agree, agree with Jeremy about people just being ordinary people. And I think, in a way, I, I, was, I was brought up as a posh girl too. No, it was not, it's not that Jeremy's a girl, but <coughs> but but from a, a quite a privileged background, yet um, which I then, you know, parted company with in the in, the, in similar circumstances as Jeremy, and and I think the, the, there was a sort of you, you you grow up with a slight sense of entitlement so that nobody is more important, <laughs> and I think it's a terrible thing to say, but it just makes it much easier when you can you're confronted with people it's who free. are. It's true because it's you need a mindset in uh, to be a long-term successful entrepreneurial producer that you're right, you know, that you know better. Mm. I mean, you don't, but you have to have some sort of confidence yeah. that you're taking loads of people over the parapet into that crossfire and loads of cash. <laughs> and you need to be sort of have some sort of confidence and you can get out the other side with something which is good. And it's the same as the director feels, but you're feeling it with the director. Okay? You're feeling that pressure. I'm sure you feel a pressure to make a really good film. You know? Yeah, I don't, I don't. the money doesn't worry me as much because as soon as it got over as much as I wouldn't want to lose in a card game, it all became quite abstract. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, you know, when you're dealing with, even at the low budget stuff, when it's like the house, the price of a small house, you're like, oh, fuck, that's a lot. That's m too much money for what it is. But when it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's like, oh, God, you just, you just don't look down after that, I think. It's the only way to do it. <laughs> Jeremy, in Mark's film, you, you talk about uh, J.G. Ballard. You say he's like your man, he's your Melville. He's a very important author to you. And we'll go back to Crash in a second, but could you talk a little bit about how the whole high-rise project came together with Ben uh, because obviously the book has been around for many years and you know then you did something very different with it but I'm just fascinated to know a little bit of the background of how following Crash how you, that came to be your next sort of ballad project with Ben. Well, there were two books that I really chased in my life with The Sheltering Sky originally I chased it for Nick Rogue who wanted to do it and I couldn't get it because Robert Aldrich owned it and um, then and cut many years later after the Oscars, we got it given to us by Warner Brothers and Bernardo. But Nick Rowe, he, he, was, he bore a little grudge that I managed to get it together with Bernardo when he wanted to make it. High Rise was another ballad book that I loved. And I started developing it into the near future, you know. And um, I had years. And I was very friendly with Ballard. He was my really good friend. We had had lots of time, good times together. And um, and I still he, he, his books still totally inspire me. His short stories and anything. And every time I, I read Ballard, it's fantastic. Anyway, I was floundering around on this, and then one day I got a call from my son, who's is in the audience, Jack, who had had a call from Ben's agent, who was a colleague of his, and they said um, Ben's got a great interest in High Rise. And um, I betrayed my magnificent colleague Vincenzo Natali who had made Cube and Cypher but we couldn't get this script right and Ben came in and said listen I want to do it like the book and um, just the same in period and uh, I'd seen Ben's magnificent early films 
and um, I was lucky that Ben liked that book and we got on well and that Amy wrote a great script and um, we managed to make it in real freedom and uh, with plenty of enough money to make a decent movie and all these wonderful actors came to the film you know they just they just wanted to be in Ben's film in Ballard with us and it was it was very really good. I'm very sad because when we started, JG was a, alive, but he didn't get to see that one. But he was um, he was a really wonderful man, one of the most wonderful men I've ever I've ever been with. So I'd like to do another one with Ben. Oh, okay then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and ben, ben, how is uh, so? I of, I assume you'd seen the film of Crash before you got into yes, this, of and course. Th that obviously caused quite a lot of uh, you know. Debate, yeah. <laughs> let's say. So was was that part of the appeal to kind of get involved with that project with Jeremy, given the history of that, or the fact that he was? I just think I didn't know. I didn't know Jeremy had the rights at that point. So it had been a, it would been and it was really really quick as well. It was like I saw the saw the book on the shelf in the house, and then I talked to my agent, can we get the rights to it? And then within two days, I was talking to Jeremy. I was like, oh shit, you know, it's <laughs> like it was it was that quick. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, and then it all started. You know, to spiral from there, didn't it? It became real very quickly, um, and then it, yeah, and it was Amy's idea really to do it as, to do it as, um, set it back into its period. And it was weird because it, it made total sense that it would be kept, be developed into the future, into the future. But the future had gotten away from the book almost, and then we just went, and a lot of the attitudes within the book didn't make any sense anymore because of social media and all sorts of stuff. So um, it kind of happened like that. But that. But I think that's also testament to Jeremy that we take the meeting. You know, this isn't the same as like working with um, Nick Roeg or or any of these guys who've like have got these massive. Yeah, but I need your film. You see, yeah, I, but I it's not quite film. the same. You didn't <laughs> seek me out. You know, I, I had to hunt I, you down. You know, in a way. I hadn't <laughs> thought of you for the film because I was doing something else. But when yeah. you came to me, I had the equipment in my brain to know this can be something. Yeah, you know, that was that's what it, it felt. You know, that that you would. That, you could see it, you know, inside it, and then and then from that point on, we were, you know, um, complete partners on it. And and he defended me all down the line. Can you know, as you can imagine, it was a difficult film to get over the line, you know, and kind of there was various battles that we'd had, including quite a a uh, excitable um, dinner with some French distributors who were telling us who thought it was brilliant up until about you know two hours in when they told us it had to be cut, you know, and reduced, and we just went nah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know that uh, that experience was fantastic, you know, and I think, um, yeah, and it was my first, my basic first experience of doing a larger film. You know, I'd never done anything like that before, so it was a complete eye opener all down the line. And I was lucky that my first experience was with Jeremy. You know, yeah. Did it I mean, did it meet expectations? Because I think Jeremy, by that stage, his reputation is so you know expansive, and the films speak for themselves. Did you did it? How did your experience of the actual day to day working with him? I think I think with films in general, you don't really understand until two or three years afterwards what had happened, you know, and you just go through it and you just survive it. But then when you look back, you understand what what an amazing thing had happened. And certainly in terms of becoming friends with people, and actors, producers, the whole lot. If you work with them for the first time, it takes the whole was, release. Yeah, it, was, of the film it was to getting. Understand. It was it was getting to know you. I mean, it was it was a classic one really because as a generational. We're the same in brain, but we're different age and different lingua franca about things. And um, at the beginning, I would understand being Ben being nervous of me, of trying to be strong, too strong, and maybe curtailing his imagination in some way. But it, it, by the end, by I suppose by halfway through the movie, um, by the time I walked into about five other people's homes <laughs> <laughs> every night. <laughs> Uh, we we were good buddies, you know, yeah. and uh, and really enjoyed each other, and and uh, and and had a. You know, but, but that's what I was saying before. It's like the it's about the managing of expectation, and in a way, like after the first day shoot, <coughs> there was a lot of pressure up until we started shooting because the film was so ambitious, and uh, and and even though it was the most money I'd ever spent on a movie before, or been in charge of in a movie before, it was still not enough by quite a lot of money to get that that film made. And through Mark Tilsley, I think was the other per mm -hmm. big big player on this who was the um, art designer who's also he's just done Bond as well but so he's brilliant Mark and the Olympics and all sorts of stuff but he you know he, he took that money and turned it in and put a zero next to it you know and then times it by 10 I think 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it was yeah that that was a, a real eye opener of, of of how to make a movie. But it was also that thing of like seeing Jeremy work with the actors and kind of, and I was like just in in the in the foxhole trying to get this pull this thing th thing through. But it, the, the the work that was done behind the scenes was massive, you know. And if it hadn't been if it'd been down to me, I'd have been like at the end of each night. All right, see you in the morning. <laughs> you know, but you have to create. You know, if you're a group away from home with actors, you have to create a, a, a possibility of a nice atmosphere. Yeah, totally. Some yeah. people want to stay completely by themselves, mm. you know. and then other people want to be um, parented, so to speak. So, a bit, you know. so, I mean, I'd love to talk more about High Rise. I think we've got to finish off very soon. So, just to sort of bring it back round to um, Mark's documentary which is available for everyone to see, and I, I highly recommend. But, I mean, I'm not spoiling it because it's the premise of it, but you drive with him across yeah. five days to Cannes. Yeah. Was that something he was, you know, readily, uh, you know, interested in? Well, my producer, David Kelly. David, there he is there. D David, thank you. David came with the idea and said, do you want to make a film about Jeremy Thomas? You know, and I thought, well, yes, I'd love to. Um, so thank you for, for that, David. And... Um, and then I thought, you know, it should, you know, the conventional way when you try to make a, when you want to make a film, sometimes you list the conventional ways of doing it, and then you strike all those ideas off because it's too obvious. So the conventional way would have been doing loads and loads of interviews uh, and sort of have a sort of co uh, you know c committee sense of. Um, Jeremy Thomas's films, and it would have the conventional way would have been said, "What was it like to work with all these people?" You know, mm -hmm. but I wanted really to focus on Jeremy's imagination, because it's a, a it's a remarkable imagination, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of discrepant imagination. It's a punky imagination, and he's sort of like a DJ as much as uh, a producer in a way his taste in music so he kind of comes from the counterculture very much and this comes across in the documentary so i thought focus on him and do a kind of r road movie where we're in a car keep the cameras in the car another conventional thing to do would have been to have a drone shot following the car as we drive through the beautiful french landscape or to have a follow car um, and you remember david we talked about that and and it, it was just that we wanted to keep it like a microcosm wasn't that the thing you know like in the car, a gruesome twosome, you know f really <laughs> focusing on this man and his imagination and keeping close to his ideas, you know, and to, you know, when th this idea of the radical Englishman, this idea of the countercultural figure, Tilda Swinton in the film talks about him as a pirate, for example, mm. and uh, other people talk, you know, th 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 it was to get close to his mind, his imagination, and because there haven't been many films about great producers, mm. this was the time to do it. Jeremy, there's obviously Cannes has been a sort of uh, a constant for you and the drive that you have, which is so fascinating to watch. Um, and you talk about when you were going there, just sort of seeing, you know, almost like a, f a sort of fishing analogy, what might come up. And I'm just wondering, just to sort of look to the future, do you still find there's enough possibility for the sort of films that you have made and want to make that those possibilities are still out there? Or do you feel that with the industry, the way it's going, that that's getting harder and harder to achieve? Or, do you, or are you actually optimistic that you can still find your way through all of that? I think since I started working, it's been a constant state of disaster of the business. You know, I don't remember a moment when people were optimistic, you know. So, I'm serious. Oh, it's so difficult. Oh, it's such a nightmare, you know. But, the death of cinema, yeah. again. <laughs> I'm that started in 1920 or something. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this magnificent art and craft will continue in its various forms. Visual storytelling, best screening is in the cinema. We all know that. And I think that uh, it's not going to be like it was, but it's been shrinking continually, but it's going to, it's going to stay. And with the stories, well, you know, if you really get a great subject and a great story and a great script, it really helps you make it. You know, that's, a, that's one of the characters of setting up the movie, is having the great, the great text or an idea, strong idea, that can at least make you and your colleagues incredibly passionate in the face of the sort of daunting odds. And uh, it's only, it's been a couple of times in my life when it's been very easy for me to make films. I had a couple of runs after his. 
Um, but basically, it's it's a very very um, hard, it's a very difficult uh, craft that needs a lot of alchemy to make an independent movie. Um, but it's the same thing. I'm see. I'm talking about it purely from my point of view as an an independent producer who wants to have independent of thought of others. And um, but now there's an enormous opportunity for people to make a lot of different themed films different ways, different things that change. I don't think it's ever been so enormous what's happening, the changing ways of people consuming stuff. And um, I'm still optimistic that, I don't know, you know, maybe a few good films left. And uh, the, the ideas of making an epic in a foreign country with a crew, analog style, that doesn't exist anymore, you know. And that was the biggest pleasure of all, was to go mm. on an adventure with a group of people with great camera crew and great mm -hmm. artists and now we don't need to go we don't have to go anywhere really. well I mean <laughs> on that bombshell, on that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's though true, yeah, yeah. but in talking about adventure I think I speak for myself and I imagine for a lot of people here thank you for sort of infecting us with your adventures it's over it. all these years and the amazing films that you put it's together a, it was a privilege to be able to make films you know, so it was a lucky, it's a very lucky profession. Or anybody who's close to the movie business in any role is very lucky. You know, it's better than work. <laughs> and thank you for sharing everything. And please, and thank you for Ben and Rebecca and Mark for being with us today. Thank you so much for joining us.